Well, good morning. My mom last night, her comment about that was, I actually understood how that video tied into the message. <laughs> Thanks, mom. I don't know. She's watching this morning, so she gets to hear me say that stuff. So the question is not, is there going to be a storm? The question is, are you going to be ready for the storm? And as Floridians, we, you know, we should know this by now. Like, we keep seeing other people get hit, and we're like, glad it wasn't me, which is a terrible thing that you people say. I'll never forget, I was at a church, and they were praying for the hurricane to go somewhere else. And when it didn't hit them, they said, see, God averted it. And it hit North Carolina, and I thought, do those people not pray as good as the Floridians? You know, a, a storm's coming, and it's just a matter of whether we're ready or not. Years ago... I went to Palm Beach Atlantic College, and we were about a mile from the beach, and you could walk onto uh, Palm Beach Island and then walk straight out to the beach. There was actually no beach there. It was actually just a seawall and water. And one night, my friend Scott and I, we were, I was a sophomore, so it was my first year at PBA, and we decided we were going to walk uh, because it was a tropical storm off the coast. So we thought, well, let's go see what that looks like. And so we walked out to the seawall. And um, this is probably when I lost my friendship with, no, we're still friends. So, so we walked out to the seawall, and we were watching the waves, and it was awesome. They were just whacking against the, the seawall, and it was just amazing. But, but I will tell you, you know, ADD is normally not an advantage, except when something unexpected happens. And so I was watching the waves, and all of a sudden I realized there was a wave that was as tall as me above the seawall. And I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, no. So because I'm not a good friend, I did not say a word to Scott. I, in my defense, I had about a millisecond, and I ducked behind the wall as Scott stood here next to me and was knocked over and drenched by the wave. And I stood back up and was dry. And he just looked at me like, like, I thought we were friends. You just let me get whacked by this huge wave. And here's the truth for all of us. There are going to be times in life, we're going to look at, you know, Daniel, the end of chapter Daniel, we've been going through the whole book of Daniel. By the way, not a lot of people teach on uh, the last two chapters of Daniel, 11 and 12, and I'm going to do that today. But um, the truth is, all of us, all of us have been or are going to get hit sometimes by the storms of life, things that happen. Uh, situations that occur, discouragement that goes on, a dream that dies. And what I'm going to do is give you three things, because when a hurricane comes, we talk about boarding up. And not all of us board up, some of us shutter up, and some of us hurricane curtain up now, but we still use the words board up. And I'm going to give you three boards, when we look at the end times, three boards that you can use, that God has given us. See, most of the time when people read things about the end times, all they say is, well, I can't do anything about that, so it doesn't really matter. But the truth is, in every story in Scripture, there's an application to your life. Even though there's one meaning, there's many applications. And so I'm going to show you today how you can apply Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12. And I hope it'll be an encouragement to you. So here's the first discouraging news. We know this. We've seen this the last few weeks in Afghanistan. War will bring death. War will bring death. And the truth is, the storms in your life will bring death. Sometimes it'll be a literal death. You'll lose a friend. You'll lose a family member. You'll lose somebody you care about to literal death. But sometimes it could be something you dreamed would happen. Uh, maybe a relationship. Maybe a marriage. You dreamed it would always go well, and that dream dies. Maybe it's a business. Uh, maybe it's a relationship with somebody you care about, a family member, and all of a sudden you realize that that's just not going to happen. And that's when that dream dies, and we can get to the place where that overwhelms us. So God starts showing Daniel what's going to happen in the future, and he goes through, uh, and we looked at the last few weeks, how he goes through basically uh, like Alexander the Great, all these different leaders, and Daniel ahead of time knew what was going to happen. And now God is giving him the long perspective, even, even farther out, and it picks up in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. At the time of the end of the king of the south will engage him in battle. And the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots, cavalry, and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. By the way, if you want to know what that looks like, think of Afghanistan. It was just like a flood. It just like we were all like, what? 
Some theologians think that this is China. In World War II, many thought this was Germany. Let me tell you who it is. I don't know. And it's okay to not know. It's okay to not know. He will also invade the beautiful land. He's talking about Jerusalem. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, the leaders of Ammon, will be delivered from his hand. He'll extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. Now, you've got to understand, Daniel was in uh, uh, Jerusalem when the king decided that Egypt was more important than God, and he aligned with Egypt, and that didn't save him. And so Daniel knew that no matter how powerful a, a country is, it's really God that holds them in our hands. We would do well as Americans to remember that. He will gain control of the treasures of gold, silver, the riches of Egypt, with the Libyans, what well, that name sounds familiar, and Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. He will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. That's what evil does. It destroys people. Some of you have friends who you've seen the enemy destroy their lives. You've seen an addiction take over and Somebody who was wonderful, all of a sudden you think, what happened? It was like a wave just came over them and they were crushed under it. We've all seen that. He will pitch his royal tent between the seas, the beautiful holy mountain, yet he'll come to his end and no one will help him. So we see this huge war and we think, what can I do about that? I, I, I hear about Armageddon. I hear about this, these, these incredible battles when you look in Revelations about the Chapter, same chapter, about chapter 12, you'll find this incredible army marching against it. And we realize that that is the end times, but let me know, let you know something too, that sometimes in life those things happen today. When life seems to be going well and all of a sudden you have this river of death flow through your life. Whether it was something you expected or a person who you cared about, all of a sudden everything changes. And so what can I do about that? I want to remind you that Christ brings life. The first board you can put up today is a board of life that Christ brings. Let me, let me read this. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And this word righteousness also means justification. Theologians love to say, just as if you've never sinned. He takes your place. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. You know, it's easy to be overwhelmed by death. It's easy to be overwhelmed. I had a student tell me this week that this is the third year, school year for them, that COVID is impacting their school. Am I ever going to get back to normal? Some of us are asking that. Some of us have had work issues and other issues. I want to encourage you, when you start to go through that time when death seems overwhelming, remember a time that Christ brought life? If you're a believer, it may be a time you could look back and say, I remember that time that I was struggling and I was floundering and I was drowning and I didn't feel like I could come above it and God saved me. And sometimes when you're going through a hard time and the storm is hitting the window, about the only thing that can help you is to remember what God has done in the past, whether it's to you or somebody else where you saw God move. Number two, evil will bring distress. Now, let me tell you something about Daniel chapter 12. If you're not a believer, Daniel chapter 12 should frighten you, should bother you. And you can take Daniel chapter 12 and then you can go to Revelation chapter 12 and you can see how from the Old Testament they understood that there was an eternity and we had to make a choice about eternity. But if you are a Christian, you don't have to worry about the end times because the truth is that you're in his hand. But how about today? How, how does life bring distress sometimes? For some of us it's anxiety. We get over-focused on something, over-hyped up about something. We just focus on it all the time. Maybe it leads for us into depression and discouragement. Maybe the enemy attacks you. I, I don't know if you can remember your first big movie. I remember going to Dayland Mall when I was in about seventh grade and seeing The Empire Strikes Back. And when we went, they wrapped the line around the building in Miami. It was a huge, literally the largest theater to this day I've ever been in. The screen, it was the biggest screen I've ever seen. 
And I remember going into that theater and my friends and I decided we would sit in the front row. And this was the, those old plasticky big seats they had and the front row leaned way back. And I remember when the beginning of that movie started and those huge spaceships are flying over and we were just like, whoa. But can I tell you that each of you have a better theater than that one? It's your fear theater. It is amazing. Something happens in your life. You go to the doctor and they say, oh, we're going to have to check this out. What? Your friend makes an offhanded comment to you. One of your relatives says something. And all of a sudden, you have the most amazing theater. It's called theater of the worst things that could happen. And it's in 3D surround sound. And you start to just play all the things that could go wrong. Any of you? It's just me. Did other people do this? I have an amazing theater. I mean, on the way out of church, you could make a little comment like, well, pastor, that was okay today. What? What did that mean? I get in my car and it just barely turns over and my brain suddenly goes, well, what am I going to do? I'll be here forever. What is it? Right? We start to play every little thing in our life. We can play it out if we don't trust God. Listen to this. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There'll be a time of distress that has not happened from the beginning of nations till then. But at that time, worse than running out of toilet paper at Publix. I just, just wanted to point that out for those of us who forgot. Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. By the way, we know that Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. This is a, a bodily resurrection, a very different time than we're talking about today. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, listen to this, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. I think that's the internet, but that's another story. So the angel says to Daniel, hey, roll this up and put it away. Let me tell you what we're really good at with our fear theater. We're really good at printing posters. This is what could happen. And we put it up on the wall, right? This is what could go wrong. The doctor said, you have a spot on your lung. Well, that means... And we stare at it all the time. And we struggle with anxiety and we struggle with fear. And as a believer, you know what God would say to us today? Roll it up. Put it away. You don't need to worry about that right now. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. And I love what he says next. He says, today has enough worries of its own. I just love that. Because he could have just said, don't worry about anything. But he said, don't worry about tomorrow. Take care of today. And so what can you do? You can't fix that poster, that movie that could happen. By the way, most of the things that you think could go wrong don't. So what are you supposed to deal with today? God, what have you put before me today? We need to roll it up and put it away. This is your second board. Is this board of comfort. The angel looks at Daniel and says, just put it away. You don't have to worry about it. This isn't going to happen right now. Just... Just put it away. Listen, sometimes you're worried about things that you can do nothing about. And you need to ask God, God, through your Holy Spirit, would you give me your comfort? Help me to roll it up and put it away. We will share in his glory. Listen to what this says. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This word for co-heirs literally is the idea of a co-signer. And last night I said, I just want to, parents, I want to tell you, your kids one day are going to come to you and say, please co-sign on a car for me that I can't afford. They won't use, they won't tell you the end of that sentence. You'll have to figure that one out. And I want you to be able to tell them, Pastor Eric said, don't do that. After church last night, a couple that was visiting for the first time walked up to me and the wife said, I signed for my son's car. And he looked at me and looked at her and I went, is he making his payments? Yes. I said, okay, good, good. I always like to offend somebody, at least one a week. But here's the good news in this. 
the Bible says that Jesus is a cosigner. Because the truth is, you and I cannot pay for our sins. I don't care how good you are. You may be the best person in this room. You do the nicest things for people. You take care of everybody. You're just, you're, you're the sweetest person in the world. Whatever. The truth is, no matter how righteous you are, even your motives sometimes are wrong. And we can't reach the perfection of Christ. It's almost like there's high heels coming for us, no matter what we do. I'm sorry, somebody was walking really down the hall. So no matter what you do, there's no perfection. Here's the good news. You know what happens if you co-sign for your kid's car and they can't pay the bills? Guess who gets to pay the bills? Guess who gets a bad knock on their credit report if they don't? This word says that Jesus co-signed for you when you gave your life to him. As difficult as life can be, as depressing as life can be, there's times that we have to have comfort in knowing that he's the one that takes care of us. That he's the one that co-signs for us. Even when we fail and falter and fall and do something really dumb. You ever done something really dumb? He signs for us. Number three. The wicked will bring desolation. And some of you have had those times of desolation. That's what we like to call depression sometimes. It's when the things you used to enjoy, you just don't enjoy anymore. That thing you used to do is just... You know, doesn't you used to love to fish? Now, when you fish, it's nothing, nothing. You kind of lost your emotions. Everything just kind of feels dead. That's desolation. It's when life hits you like a wave so strong that it feels like there's nothing left. That's going to happen in the end times. Here's what he says to Daniel in verse nine: Go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed till the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. You mean there's going to be bad people for the rest of time? Until eternity, yeah. Yeah, the wicked will continue to be wicked. There'll be people who will tell you one thing and do another. There'll be people who pretend to be your friends <laughs> that are just using you. There'll be people who act like they care about you. And they just want what you have. The wicked will continue to be wicked. But then it continues. None of the wicked will understand. But those who are wise will understand. From that time that the daily sacrifice is abolished. And the abomination that causes desolation is set up. And then he goes into this number of days. Let me tell you what that means. I have no idea. And either does anybody else. And if anybody tries to tell you they know when Jesus is coming back. You just need to look at him and go, thanks so much. Over and over, they've tried to make this number into something. And let me tell you what it means. I don't know. But I know the day's coming. As for you, listen to what he says to Daniel. As, you, as for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you'll rise to receive your inheritance. What does he say to Daniel? Hey, you don't need to worry about this. You're not going to be here for it. Do what you're supposed to do today. So what do we do? What do we do? Listen to what the final thing is. We need to understand that believers will be with Christ. See, you and I have his love. If you're a Christian, you have God's love with you so that no matter what happens around you, you don't have to worry about it. On your worst day, when you catch whatever you're going to catch or you have whatever you're going to have, or when you go to sleep and your heart decides that it's not going to beat anymore, you don't have to worry. Because you have his love. Listen to what it says. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor any powers, neither height or depth or anything else in creation. That's a lot of stuff. Will be able to separate from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word love there is not the friendship love. It's not Philadelphia. It's agape. It's God's full love for you. And here's the truth. If you're a believer, God has given you his love. And there'll be days that you don't have any of your own love left. You're tired. You're desolate. You've been through the mill. You've experienced death. You've experienced destruction. And now you're up to desolation and you have nothing left. But God still does. And so in those days, you have to say, God, I don't have anything left. Could you fill me with your love? I don't want to be loving. 
God, I, I, I want to run away. God, I don't want to put up with this anymore. God, would you give me your love? And here's what's awesome about that. When you take a small step towards people to do what God wants you to do in love. Now, I'm not talking about being abused. I'm not talking about being a doormat. I'm not talking about not having boundaries. I'm talking about those times when you're totally done. And you say, God, would you show me how to be loving in this situation? Lord, would you show me how to be loving to that neighbor, to that relative, to that person in my life, to that person in my office? Lord, would you show me how to show love to the people I come in contact with? And when you do that, can I tell you what happens? It's amazing when you realize that you have nothing left and you let God use you in love. You know what happens? He begins to fill you with his love again. That desolation that seemed to overtake you gets overtaken by his love. I want to encourage you. If you're dealing with one of these things now, maybe you're feeling discouraged, desolate. I want to encourage you. Hey, ask God. God, would you remind me of a time where you brought life? God, would you give me your comfort so that I know you're going to take care of me no matter what? And God, would you show me someone that I can show your love to? Just in a small way, God, show me how I can show somebody your love. If you'll do that, no matter what storm keeps coming and knocking you down, just like Forrest Gump, you'll wake up one day and you'll go, hey, he worked all things out for the good because I love him, because I'm listening to him. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. This chapter is talking about the end times. Hey, I want to know that I'm going to be in eternity with you. One of the awesome things about having a church family is we sometimes have church suppers together. And it says that in heaven we'll also have supper together. I love that. And I'd love you to be with me. So if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you can do that today. When you say, Jesus, I know you died for me and rose again. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm messed up. By the way, not a whole lot of people struggle with knowing they're messed up. And I need you. When we surrender, this is the hard part of the Christian life, is faith. God, I surrender my life to you, and I want to follow you the rest of my life. When we do that, knowing that he died for our sins and rose again so that he's the co-signer, so that when we get to heaven, we have a Millie Vanilli moment. I know you don't know who Millie Vanilli is. Google it later. You remember Millie Vanilli? They never sang for themselves. Did you know that? Other people sang for them. When you get to heaven... And God says, hey, why should I let you in? Jesus steps in front of you and goes, I got this. And you just get to go, Millie Vanilli. God, I need you. So if you want to do that today, you can. And if you're a Christian and the truth is you've been trying to do everything on your own, maybe it's time to Millie Vanilli it. It's time to give up. Let God work in you. Quit trying to do it all yourself. You're getting this tired. Just let him do it. Let's go to Lord in prayer today. Father, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength. I thank you that in the middle of darkness, your light shines. And Father, I know in this world right now, there's a lot of people going through all kind of different storms. Some are, some are emotional, some are frustration, some are depression and discouragement, even desolation in their lives. Father, I want to pray that you would bring your light like Rodney talked about. Lord, when we feel dry and out of love, I pray you'd fill us with your love that only you can give. And Lord, I pray if anyone here or watching online doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their hearts and lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.